Um, and yeah, thanks George for, for the introduction and for that uh, um, great speech on, on privacy because it, you know, this is the, the, the perfect motivation for, for my talk and, and you know, you've, you've actually said some of the things that I would have said as well, so I can skip over them. Um, <laughs> well, no, you know, I mean... Um, I'm not even billed as a, as a speaker. <laughs> So uh, I um, guess just, just to gauge you know, how I'm going to structure this talk, who here, has someone here already heard a talk about bulletproofs from me? So you're like, okay, so a couple people. So I'll still uh, go into it, but then I also want to talk about uh, so-called proofs of solvency, which is something that we can do today already with, with, with privacy features, and um, uh, we call that protocol provisions. So as George already mentioned, um, you know, uh, this is, uh, picture of a, of a Bitcoin transaction. And as uh, Dr. Ray mentioned, there's a lot of things here that are revealed. And the first thing, what is, you know, the, the, the when is a Bitcoin transaction valid? Well, you know, there's a simple or main condition that one needs to check, mainly that the, the sum of the inputs is equal to the, is greater or equal than the sum of the outputs. Which I've made this the other way around. And the difference is actually the fee. But as you can see here, you can see you know, the, the sender's addresses, the receiver's addresses, and, and very importantly, you can see the amounts that are being sent, right? And that seems important because you want to be able to check whether the transaction is valid. So you want to be able to check this equation. So this is why these amounts are public. But the problem with that is, as George already mentioned, I, I want to give it you know, yet another angle, is that even, you know, it's not, uh, even if we say uh, you know, we uh, don't care about personal privacy, which should care about it, but even you know, say for businesses, this is this is very problematic. Say I'm I'm uh, paying all my employees in, in Bitcoin, then you know all of the salaries are public. Or if I buy some goods from a supplier, then you know this immediately means that everybody can see how much I'm paying for my supplies, which is an important business secret. And you might ask, you know, like, uh, but but Bitcoin is untraceable, right? Bitcoin is. is, is um, sort of, you know, uh, was, was uh, introduced as this thing that we can use uh, to buy drugs and, and everything. But the problem is that, that both in, in, in research and in practice, this is not really true, right? There's been a lot of research papers showing that how to trace Bitcoin transactions. And in fact, these things are, have now been commercialized. They're companies that will do these tracings uh, for you, you know, often for, for government agencies. So this is a, this is a reality, you know, these, these companies wouldn't do it if they weren't successful and they couldn't make money with it. And there is things like you know mixers and, and all of that stuff that and, and reuse not reusing your addresses that, that help a little bit, but it turns out that even if you don't reuse your addresses, everything is still linked together and it's pretty easy to trace these things. And especially if you have the dollar amounts attached, because you know if you if I see uh, um, you know a, a Bitcoin transaction here, you know like, uh, well, can you guess there's an output of two Bitcoin and there's an output of 0 0.01031 Bitcoin. Which output do you think was the amount that was sent to the receiver and which output was the change amount? Like, it's pretty obvious that probably the round, you know, the, 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 the round amount, the two Bitcoin was sent to the receiver and the other address is the change amount. So if I know, you know, one of them is your address, then I also know this is your address now, right? Like it's, it's just simple heuristics like that work, work amazingly well. Um, so if you think about it, you know, if we think about digital payments, it actually, and we compare it both, you know, like uh, we have, uh, to other payments, but importantly, if we compare it to what the majority of people still use today, it turns out that actually, you know, Bitcoin and, 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 and other cryptocurrencies actually kind of worse than what we use today. Because right now, if I do bank account transfers and if I do transfers on Venmo, then it's true that that uh, entity can see everything I have, and that's you know, also very scary for, for uh, a lot of the reasons that George mentioned. But the problem is, like in, in, in Bitcoin, it's public, right? Everybody can see it. It's not just that uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the person that I have a business relationship can see it. Like literally everybody can see the whole idea of a blockchain is, is you know, that it is, or uh, of a public blockchain is that everybody can see it and verify every transaction. So, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, very linkable and, and, you know, accounts sort of make it worse. And, you know, like if we think about Libra, for example, you know, now Facebook uh, or 
uh, has your personal data and now will also everybody will be able to see your transaction data actually and you know then you have on the other side of the spectrum you have uh, cash um, which is going away as you just heard and, and you know you have cryptographic solution like uh, Zcash um, but really the, 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 the sort of the question is you know should we do we want a, a digital payments future where our digital payments and are worth worse in terms of privacy than what we currently have. And you know, this sort of leads to the question, how much privacy do we need? And I think this is, a, is actually a complex question where there's trade-offs, but you know, there's uh, different questions that come up, of course. You know, what about crime? What about tax evasion, money laundering, regulation? But really the question that I want to focus today is uh, what is possible and realistic? And the nice thing is that it turns out, at least technically, a lot is possible and realistic and, and uh, sort of practically feasible. Uh, so getting a lot of privacy. So you know, going back to the Bitcoin transaction, um, as I said, the validity of, of the Bitcoin transaction it sort of depends on three things: the signature being correct, the inputs being unspent, and uh, this this final equation that the sum of the inputs is equal to the sum of the outputs plus the fee. So you know, an, a natural idea, you know, as a, as a cryptographer, is a, you know, how how do we how do we uh, protect against this? So we, you know, one idea is that we at least want to, you know, protect, for example, the amounts and uh, that are being sent. So you know, if you couldn't see which amounts, then also the the tracing of transaction would be, a, you don't have to reveal what your salary is, and which is probably the most significant information is, is are the amounts in the transaction, and then even uh, who's paying whom gets it's a little bit harder to trace because suddenly you know you don't have this two bitcoin output which is very identifiable so we can use something called a cryptographic commitment which uh, has two properties so you can think of it as as an envelope you know i write the amount into an envelope and then i close the envelope so the nice thing is if the envelope is not see through i cannot see how much you've committed to what is your amount but I can also not later on. I can open it, but I can only open it to what I've put into it, right? Or you, a lockbox would, would work as well in encryption. So we call this a, a cryptographic commitment, and it has these two properties that it's hiding, it hides the amount, but it's also binding. If I commit it to uh, 533, I will only be able to open it later to 533. And these are uh, sort of special commitments that that also have homomorphic or additive properties, so if I have two commitments, then I can create a commitment to the sum. And the problem though is now these, these commitments, they hide our values. The fees, by the way, are always still public because the miners need to see them and verify them. Um, but the question is how do I now check this equation? You know, How do I now verify that the sum of inputs is equal to the sum of L outputs plus the V? And there's actually a, a question which turns out to be the harder part of the question is, how do I check that all of the outputs are positive? You know, this is so obvious in, in a normal transaction that, that you know, why we wouldn't even ask yourself. But say one of the outputs was negative. So I put in three Bitcoin, one of the outputs is minus 10 Bitcoin, the other <coughs> output is 13 Bitcoin. So this equation still holds, but suddenly now I have, I put in one, three Bitcoin and I have one output which is worth 13 Bitcoin. So that's also very problematic. So this question, you know, checking that the outputs are positive is actually the, the, the harder one. So this idea of a, of a, so how, you know, it seems sort of fundamental, this, this, this problem, like, you know, how do we check this, that the transaction is valid, even though we've hidden the most important information for checking that the transaction is valid. So uh, Greg Maxwell, uh, you know, introduced this concept of, of confidential <coughs> transactions. They have the nice property that they're very, you know, they're basically structured like Bitcoin transactions. Uh, and would be uh, you know, sort of compatible with that. Uh, but you know, you still reveal the, the transaction graph. Um, Zcash you know, solves that problem of also how to hide the transaction graph. But I want to you know, stick to the sort of simpler problem. But yeah, how do we get this, this, this question? How do we solve the, this public verifiable of transaction validity? So the solution that you know, maybe you've already heard about this tool is uh, uh, cryptography comes to the rescue here. It's called a zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So the idea is that, that I have a prover Peggy, and Peggy has some commitment C. 
and she wants to convince verify Victor that um, the the it's a commitment to a positive number, and you know Victor says prove it. And the way that these protocols work, these 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 uh, zero knowledge proofs, is that Victor gets to ask questions, which uh, Peggy can answer. And she can only answer them if the statement that she says is true. So she can only answer them if x is, in fact, a positive number. But the key property is that these answers reveal no information whatsoever about what x is. So after the fact, and you know, you, this might be a multiple round protocol, Victor has no idea what x is, but it must be positive, and Peggy must know it. This is, you know, this 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 really cool cool magic of zero knowledge proofs, and you know, you can um, look up on the internet, you know, you how to. There's like some. It's actually not, you know, that hard to understand how to do it for, you know, say a Sudoku puzzle. Once you know how to do it for a Sudoku puzzle, you can phrase everything as a Sudoku puzzle because it's an MP complete problem. So you know, we can do it for these things. Um, so you know, really, the, the the question is, it uses some randomization, and and but really, the key property is that. Peggy couldn't answer these questions if she didn't, if the statement wasn't true, but the answers don't reveal any information. And we call this specific proof, this specific zero knowledge proof, a range proof. Because we prove that x is positive, but really we prove that it is in some small range between 0 and 52 bits. So it turns out that we can make this whole thing even non interactive, right? Like this was an interactive protocol between a prover and verifier. We can also make this a non interactive protocol. Proof where, where Peggy just writes down the proof, and then um, the verifier can check it and is convinced that it's positive. And the nice thing is that the proof works for, for, for everyone. So I can just attach it to a transaction, and then everybody can verify the proof in the transaction. And we need something, you know, there's some so called common reference string which both parties have access to. Um, and the, 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 the previous range proof, uh, before bulletproofs that was used for these confidential transactions, was about four, you know, with some optimizations by, by uh, Polstra et al., um, was about four kilobytes for a 64 bit range proof. And it was a so called linear range proof. So, you know, the larger my range, the, the, the larger the, the, it's like linear in the size of the proof. There's other. Um, Proofs that you may have heard of, which is used in, in, in Zcash, which is so-called SNARK, a pre-processing SNARK with a trusted setup. So the, the general high-level idea of how a SNARK works is that there's some you know nice guy who does the, the setup, and he encrypts some queries in a, in a very special way. And he also encrypts sort of answers to these queries or, or checking key for these, for these queries. And uh, then the prover, Peggy, can compute a very short proof. You know, the sh proof is, is, is uh, like 200 bytes, no matter how complex the, the uh, statement is that uh, the prover proves. And, and the verifier um, can very efficiently check this proof. And you know, the, the setup is very fairly slow, the proving is slow, but the verification is very, uh, very efficient. And there's been you know a lot of amazing work. You know this, this really only started in, in 2010, and now we have it deployed publicly. And this, these tools are like just just it's it's completely amazing that we have them, right? Like you can prove an arbitrarily complex statement with 200 bytes, and it takes a, a couple of milliseconds to check. Um, and you know it's it's as far as we know, it's cryptographically sound. There is one caveat though. Which is we need this setup here, right? We need this trusted setup, and uh, the problem is if the setup is malicious, right? If there's a person who created the setup and you know he cheated, then or he colluded with the prover, then you can create fake proofs. Okay. So, why, what does this mean? Well, what this means is that I can create uh, a transaction which isn't valid, which, for example, creates more money than than it had as inputs. And then I attach this, this, this cheating proof, and uh, you know, and then suddenly the transaction verifies, everything looks good to the outside, but suddenly I created money out of thin air. And this is, in cryptocurrencies, this is really a, 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 a gigantic problem, because the subversion is undetectable. The, the, the privacy aspect is actually not uh, ruined, and this is one case where we really, this is really problematic that the privacy is so good 
because what this means is undetectable inflation. So if I can create fake proofs, if I can subvert the system, <coughs> then I created money out of thin air and no one will be able to notice. So I just create you know, new coins, sell them, lower the price of the, the currency of Zcash or whatever, and um, uh, you know, everybody is uh, sort of worse off, but you know, like people can at most have suspicions about things being wrong. Right? There's nothing, you know, there's nothing really that, that we can do to check whether there's actually inflation or not, right? Unless someone, you know, suddenly creates uh, 30 million Bitcoin, then we'll see, oh, shit, something's <laughs> going really wrong, right? You know, if you're kind of smart about it, then you can really extract the, m the maximum damage. It's like even worse than being able to, to, to steal other people's keys, because at least they will know, oh, my money is getting stolen. And here, no one really sees that, that my money is being stolen. So the problem is that you know even the fear of undetectable inflation is dangerous, right? Like no one, I don't, I like Zcash is uh, you know no one. Uh, why, why are people even using Zcash? Well, they, you know it's people actually believe that, and, and there's very good reason to believe they did a very proper job at, at doing the setup. And but still, if people go out and say like, oh, I don't, I don't trust Zcash, you know the setup is broken. The problem is that, like the the you know the the, the great team at Zcash and they have amazing researchers, like there's nothing they can like fundamentally they can say oh we did the best job that we possibly could and and so on and so forth, but like fundamentally there's there's at some point there's nothing that they can say other than like oh well you know you just have to trust that this thing was done correctly, and like what they've done like so why do people trust Zcash is because they did a lot of work doing this distributed setup where you know, like I think uh, maybe uh, 30 people or maybe 100 people or so participated, and as long as one out of these 100 people is, is honest, everything is okay, right? So you, you don't need to trust, uh, like you don't need to trust one single person, you need to trust 100 persons, people that they didn't collude or that no one hacked all of them at the same time. And you know, there's actually, uh, and this is expensive, but then for Zcash, there's actually, um, well, there was a bug. It wasn't, you know, like something malicious, but there was a bug with the setup, and, and uh, you know, there would have been a way to create money out of thin air. They luckily the Zcash team caught it themselves, but you know, it's it's pretty scary. Um, the problem is also that you need a s new setup for every for every time you have new functionality. So, say you have a new script or whatever, you sort of need a new setup. There's now like kind of ways around it, but but really, you know, like the the, the Snarks uh, fundamentally they're like sort of tied to the functionality, and then so this makes it really expensive because every time I want to upgrade, so Zcash didn't upgrade, so they had to do a new setup, right? And you know this is a new point of vulnerability, and you know <coughs> there's a system called Hawk, Hawk, where where you know every smart contract would have a new setup. So you know this was the the motivation for for bulletproofs, which has short proofs like Snarks, but doesn't have a trusted setup. And it builds um, on, on amazing uh, prior work from, from the University College London, which also already had no trusted setup and, and only used the, the discrete log assumption. So that's the same assumption as Schnorr signatures. So it's a very, very safe assumption. And, and we inherit these properties from the prior work. And this is joint work with some of the Bitcoin core developers, uh, Jonathan Bull and, and uh, my advisor, Dan Bonet. And it has uh, some nice properties. Actually, the key property is that it's the proof size is logarithmic in the size of the statement. Um, so the proofs are very short. The other nice properties is that you know, in, in the statement that I talked about, these range proofs, I need to prove something about a previously committed value. Right? And, and turns out that bulletproof is very efficient for these kinds of proofs, which is important for range proofs. There's an MPC for proof creation. What does that mean? Well, say you know multiple people here wanted to create a transaction together, right? Um, you know, a coin join. Say we wanted to do a coin join, and we wanted to have one transaction together. Well, it turns out that we can run a small, like, efficient protocol to create one proof for all of our transactions together. So this has two benefits. One is the privacy benefit of coin join, but now there's actually also an efficiency benefit because the proof size is logarithmic. It means that you know, a hundred proofs is uh, you know like the or a thousand proofs is only like um, uh, twenty or forty elements bigger than uh, than one proof, right? Because 
the log of 1,000 times x is log of x plus log of 1,000, which is you know, 20. But um, so, right, so there's like an efficiency benefit of, of pooling our resources together and creating this proof. And Bulletproofs admits, admits this, uh, admits this uh, you know, very efficient MPC for proof creation. And also, you know, uh, in, in, in the, the Bitcoin case, you know, or the, the, the cryptocurrency case, you want to verify, right, like you often want to verify a whole block as one, right? So you need to verify multiple proofs at once. And, and we sort of give an optimization where verifying many proofs at once is more efficient than, like verifying n proofs at once is more efficient than n times verifying one proof, which is very good because this is exactly the, the scenario that we have. And, and both proofs works for these range proofs, but it also works for arithmetic circuits. And what this really means, it works for arbitrary computations. So if I want to prove to you an arbitrarily you know, complex statement, like uh, you know, I, I, I paid my tax, my taxes are this amount, and, and we have a circuit, you know, we have some program which encodes the tax code, which I guess would be pretty hard, but um, in theory, like say we have a program which encodes the tax code, then I can say like, here are my taxes, I did it correctly, but uh, dear Uncle Sam, you don't have to learn anything about, like uh, I don't have to reveal to you like what, what I've done, what kind of business activities I've done. So, uh, and you could do that with, with the bullet proofs, just like a snark. So the proof size, you know, I'm gonna show you that, that logarithms are nice. Um, so if we think about a, a single range proof, you know, the proof size would be about 670 bytes versus four kilobytes for the, the, the previous range proof. And snarks are always small, you know, they're like two, under 200 bytes. But the nice thing is, you know, now say I have a transaction and there's two outputs, which is usually the case. Then I need to do two range proofs. And it turns out that that is, uh, you know, only, it only adds uh, 64 bytes each time. So I'm at 736 bytes now. And, you know, even if I have 10 proofs, I'm still under a kilobyte, right? Uh, and and versus the, the the old range proofs would have been 38 kilobytes. So you know this is really where where the the benefits uh, come in. And um, I'll skip over and write like with this MPC, we really also now have a way such that you can create a transaction where we can pool our resources together and create a transaction for all of us together. Um, which has many, many outputs, right? And, uh, you know, get additional privacy benefits from that. And, uh, you know, there's also the, well, for, for um, larger proofs, um, there's also, you may have heard of Starks, uh, which are also just these super beautiful proofs, um, but they are unfortunately more in the, the hundred of kilobytes uh, range, um, even though asymptotically they're very efficient. And, but we can see that you know, for, for even for a Zcash style uh, proof, you know, the, the proof would be about 1.2 kilobytes. Verification would be about 10 times slower than, than uh, what we have with SNARKs today. Maybe that's okay, maybe not, you know, that's, uh, I don't know, depends on your system. Right now for Zcash it would totally work because no one is actually using the private transactions, but you know, then maybe that's not, that's kind of sad, right? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I guess this comes back to what George was saying about having privacy as a default, right? The, Zcash does not have privacy as a default, so people don't really use the private transactions. Um, so, if you've, uh, you know, if you're sort of active in the space, you may have heard that there's actually a lot of, you know, I've already talked about three different, or four, I've talked about all of these proof systems. There's a lot of development in zero knowledge proofs going on, and this is like uh, really, really cool uh, because it like, comes just at the time where it seems like with cryptocurrencies we have the perfect use case for these zero knowledge proofs. Uh, and when you know we have all of these like new zero knowledge proof systems coming up and uh, yeah there's you know like I think where bulletproofs really really shines it's like the downside is that the verification time is linear. So you know if you have really large and complex statements your, your verification time becomes uh, more and more expensive. This is as opposed to, to to, to snarks, which where the verification time is constant, or starks, where also the verification time is only <coughs> logarithmic or polylogarithmic. But you know where it really shines is that the proofs are very small still, almost as small as snarks, and it doesn't require the trusted setup. So starks, for example, are asymptotically they're great, but in practice the proofs are you know fairly large, especially they're probably too large to attach to every single transaction. 
So you know, for every uh, for different uh, like use cases, there's just different tools which are the right tool for the job, and there's like way more you know tools out there. You know, the trade of space is large and, and growing, and you know there's there's many more uh, like the knowledge proof systems that hit different you know parade optimal points in the trade of space. So yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a cool time uh, for the space and. The the one of the nice things uh, about working with uh, you know Peter and, and Andrew is that they immediately took this and, and, and implemented this into the Bitcoin cryptographic library libsec two five six k one you know with a, with a constant time prover which means like a secure to use prover and optimized verifier and now there's uh, actually a Rust implementation by Interstellar which is even faster using like AVX two instructions and they did, an, did a really cool job. Uh, and some of the benchmarks, I don't know, they might even be outdated, it might even be better, but uh, well, the, 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 the real, the message of this, so you know, we have the, the proving time in, in milliseconds and the verification time, and then this is the batch verification time. So you know, if I want to verify many, many proofs at once, what is sort of the marginal cost of verifying an additional proof? And the thing to look at here is that, well, A, you know, verifying is proof Batch verifying a proof is like under a millisecond, or you know, four proofs are still under a millisecond. But really, this is I, I like this point because what this says is that um, batch verifying z bullet proofs with 16 output transactions, you know, transaction which has 16 outputs, is as expensive as uh, verifying 16 ECDSA signatures. So really, you know, like at least at this point, what this means is that like bulletproof is not more expensive, like for the verifier in terms of computation, than uh, verifying, you know, just sign ECDSA signatures, which is exactly what miners do today in Bitcoin, right? You know, or before. Uh, so you know, this is well, what this is saying is that this is really, you know, quite quite practical. And uh, some applications. I'll actually, you know, this, uh, I guess, you know, this maybe you heard, but this got implemented in, Bull in, in Monero, which was very cool. Um, the transaction fees dropped by 97%, which is honestly like, you know, it's a, it's a uh, well, like, it dropped like immediately. I don't, I have to look up where the transaction fees are now, but right, like the way that, that these economics work is that as soon as you're under the, the block size limit, the, the fees for transactions drop to almost zero, right? Because there's no more competition. Like there weren't enough, the, f the size of these transactions dropped so much that basically adding a transaction to the Monero network was free. That's why the fees dropped so much. Like it's not like that the, the transactions were in actually 97, like three, uh, only 3% of the old transactions. <coughs> they were about like a factor of 10 smaller, which is still pretty good. But you know, <coughs> we got like, you know, it just sounds nice, 97%. But the, the application that I quickly want to talk about, uh, I guess I'll go for five more minutes because I think the time is running out, is these proofs of solvency. Um, and uh, so what is this? So this is actually work that we did uh, before Bulletproofs, but Bulletproofs is very applicable to it. So um, uh, the idea is that you know most people actually don't use Bitcoin directly. You know They use it through like some sort of exchange uh, or su through some sort of custodial wallet and and you know it seems like this this will be the the reality for some time to come and, and there's actually like you know if you think about it there's decent reason for it uh, it's it's nice because now running an, a bank or running an exchange is actually much simpler than running a real world bank um, but you know there's still this problem that these these exchanges store your keys, right? You don't actually store your own keys. And they look a lot like uh, online banks. There's the word banks is missing. Um, and the problem is, of course, you know, if you've been around for some time, you know that these exchanges have a shakier track record. It actually is, you know, like getting a lot, lot better, luckily, but, you know, 50% have, uh, uh, in 2013, like the estimate was that 50% have failed and, you know, the the notorious example is, is, is Mt. Gox, right, where, where a lot of money was lost and I think the bankruptcy proceedings are still going on. And if you, <coughs> if you were uh, alive during that time, uh, you may remember that, you know, there was a long, for a long time, a, 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 
the question of like, is Mt. Gox solvent, right? You know, is, is, uh, does, do they have the money or, you know, is it not? And right, like there were people camping outside and I think Roger Ware, uh, you know, <coughs> went in and said like, oh yeah, Mt. Gox is solvent. I don't know how that went, but um, yeah, you know, like it, and it turned out actually that after the fact they had lost a bunch of money to a hack and they weren't solvent, they were running a fractional reserve. So, and that probably made things worse because then they lost more and more money. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy story. I hope they're gonna make a movie soon. Um, so the goal is, you know, like, wouldn't it be nice if in exchange, we wouldn't have to trust like the exchange to say, you know, hey, I'm solvent. Wouldn't it be nice if they could prove cryptographically that they're solvent? So, you know, you have your users and you have all of the balances that the users have at the exchange. And the exchange owns some uh, Bitcoin uh, addresses and owns the private keys to some Bitcoin addresses. And, and the question is really like, what does solvency mean? Well, it means that the total liabilities is less than the total uh, 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 assets, right? Where we're going for full reserve here, right? Like the, 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 the exchange is supposed to store more assets than it has liabilities. And, uh, you know, what's the, the classical solution to this? Well, it's, uh, you know, you have an auditor that comes in and says, you know, this looks good to me. And this is really what, you know, banks and companies use all the time now in the real world. So, um, but it turns out that we are now living in a, in a, in a cryptographic world with a, with a ledger, and maybe we can do better there. And and Greg, uh, you know, had some uh, first cryptographic <coughs> approach where, you know, the idea was to store all of the balances in, in a Merkle tree, and then uh, if I'm Bob, right, then the exchange would show to me, hey, you are included in this Merkle tree, right? your balance is DB and I can verify, okay, this has my name and my balance and this is the correct balance. Um, and the, you know, I would get the, the Merkle path and the Merkle path would not be, you know, just the hashes, but it would also, you know, sum up the amounts, right? So I could always verify that, you know, I would have to verify that I also see BA and then I would have to verify that the hash of these two things is, uh, is up, stored up. Uh, the sum, this is the hash of these two things and also the sum of the two balances. So then at the top of the tree, I get the total liabilities that the exchange has. And you know, then I have to also prove that I have that much assets. And uh, what I do is you know, I, I do just a large transaction on the Bitcoin network or provide a signature using my private key. And uh, this is a uh, Bitstamp actually did this back in the day in 2014. And uh, it turns out that, that you know, this is uh, considered too leaky. And Kraken actually said, like, hey, sorry, we can't do this because you know, it would reveal all of our balance containing addresses. And uh, this is problematic. And you know, it would also reveal some information about the account sizes. And, and the, uh, you know, like, uh, it reveals you know, how much do you have in total liabilities, some information about you know, your account sizes. You actually see always from your neighbor, you see how much uh, balance they have. So um, really a lot of information here gets le leaked and especially also the Bitcoin addresses that you have. So we reveal nothing in our protocol. And the one thing that we don't conceal, completely conceal is the number of users, right? That's, uh, that, that would be a public information. Um, and then, uh, so how can we do this, you know? And again, obviously, you know, the. The answer is uh, zero knowledge proofs. So, uh, you know, the same idea, right? Peggy can prove that I know private key to Bitcoin addresses with at least a thousand Bitcoin in them. And Victor will be convinced that this is true. I know that Peggy's rich, but she doesn't know what Peggy's addresses are. So, uh, at a very high level, the way that this works is that, you know, you have your uh, Bitcoin network and you take some anonymity set. So, you take a set of addresses. And this includes your addresses as well, but it's a large anonymity set. You can even make the, all of the addresses that were ever used, but you know, that would be more expensive. And then you do um, a proof of liabilities. So what this means is you prove that you create a commitment to your total liabilities. So the, the whole, total amount of money that, uh, wait, that should be proof of assets. Sorry, this is the wrong way around. So you do a proof that you know there's a commitment to how much money you have in total, and um, and then you prove that you know for each address, uh, you know here this is the for each of these addresses, either I know the private key, so I own them and I'm adding this to my total assets, or I don't know the private key and then I'm adding zero. 
So uh, this this will be a commitment to the total amount of money that I own, and I do something similar for for the users. And then the idea is that you know the assets minus the liabilities is a commitment to zero. So this is actually you know this is like somewhat practical, and we we talked to to Bitcoin exchanges back in the day, but you know. Like in, in some ways, I think maybe they didn't have the, the technical know-how or you know, they were worried about other stuff or maybe they're not, all not solvent, no, I don't know. But uh, you know, unfortunately, no one has, has really implemented and run this, but I still have great hope and I still think that it's a you know, very cute protocol and it, what it really takes is sort of users demanding these cryptographic proofs. I think that would, would really push exchanges to, to be able to use them, right? So if there was like user awareness of that this exists, right? And uh, then demands, and you know, every exchange that didn't do this would suddenly be considered sort of uh, sketchy. Um, of course, proofs of solvencies have severe limitations. Um, it's a snapshot. Only because I'm solvent in one second doesn't mean that you know I've lost my keys the, the second afterwards. And also, a proof of solvency is not the same as as uh, like having the the willingness to pay out, right? And and that is again like pretty inherent, right? There's you know, only if I prove to you that, that I'm solvent, you know, you need some sort of outside judicial system or something like that, you know, to be able to enforce this liability. But I think, you know, this is something that we can deal with, right? Like we do have judicial systems, we do live in the real world. But the, the key idea is, you know, that uh, again, provisions is pretty practical. If you use bulletproofs, you know, it's, uh, it's a few kilobytes for, for millions of users, you know, takes maybe an hour to compute, but like, maybe takes even a little bit longer, but you know, this is, these exchanges have, they can afford powerful machines, so you know, could, they could run this once a day maybe, and checking your inclusion or checking the, the uh, is, is basically free. Um, so the, you know, the idea is that, that, that the, the summary, I guess, is that, that real privacy for cryptocurrencies is feasible, and it doesn't also necessarily contradict compliance, right? You can do a lot of these things, you know, at least in theory, we very much know how to do uh, a lot of these things where, where you know, you, you, you still get regulatory compliance. Um, whether you want that or not is a, is a different question, but it's at least technically we're able to do it, um, but still get cryptographic, uh, you know, guarantees. And, and really this is, you could call this a cryptographic transparency where you reveal exactly what you want to reveal and nothing more and nothing less, right? And that is exactly what cryptography is very good at. And uh, yeah, and I hope that you know um, that we move to a world where we have more privacy guarantees. Um, so you can find these these papers online and also on my website. You know uh, my my other work on cryptocurrencies. Thank you. <laughs>